And possibilities here. When I press this too close to this thing over here, it buzzes. Um, we have uh, three entering tunnels, but each of those tunnels has a number of possible entrances on it. I don't think she came this way, even though this is the closest way in. That way. It's 2,100 feet from that nearest entrance through which one could walk. I could come in through a La Virgen entrance down here. Um, there's another entrance someplace off in the distance out this way, probably 6,200 feet away. And uh, uh, La Concha, which is 2,800 feet. But all the animals are on the south side. They're not on the north side of the, of the Oyo Negro, which means they didn't fall in from the north tunnel. And uh, most of them have drifted from their fall off in the direction of east, so they probably came not that way, but this way, somewhere. We just haven't found the entrance yet. We've got Kauai, not Kauai, uh, um, small road, little dog-sized rodent tracks in there, um, agouti tracks in the cave in that area. So there's an entrance the agouti's got into somewhere, but we haven't found it yet. So, with the age, how, when did she arrive there? I'm going to do this just because I'd like to. I've been telling people I'm trying to date a 16-year-old Mexican girl, but they just think I'm a dirty old man. <laughs> yeah, she's the old one, right? She'd be robbing the cradle. Yeah. Anyway, the question is, are she in the gauntlet here? This is to scale, by the way. For Actually, she'd be a lot smaller than that, and I would be. But anyway, this is to scale. And to give you the thing, this I actually got off the internet being her as being used for scale of a Miocene gondolier. I just cut her out and pasted her on a Pleistocene, not on Kubiromia. But um, that gives you a sense of the relationships of size in any case. So how old is Naya? How long ago did she die? Well, there are a number of different ways we've had to use to do this work. Um, I, I believe in backing up what you're doing and then backing up your backup and then backing that up if you absolutely can. So, the animals that we have, the 27 animals and nine up that are on the bottom of the cave, are scattered on the south side, or the south and east side of the, of the cave floor, of the pit. They are, um, oh, yeah, um, <laughs> my phone is buzzing in my pocket, it's very distracting. <laughs> There, it stopped. Good. Okay. <laughs> anyway, the red barks show where the highest point is of each of the animals that we have. So, they, they floated up at least that far. They were, they were scattered on the floor, and they're scattered around this ring. And uh, those points are all within about a three meter span, and they form a bathtub ring around that south side of the pit. It's the deeper part of the pit. That bathtub ring is matched by a real bathtub ring of charcoal around the walls of the cave. And a stain zone right through here. It has a lot of iron from humic acids marking it. So it was a... I've been arguing this with a geologist over and over and over again that we had to have water in there at least periodically to have this happen, they finally accepted that argument. I was saying we had a, a permanent pool a while, they said, no, no, that's not possible. So we've, we've settled on a, an occasional pool because these limestone systems are just porous as can be, it's just a sponge. And sea level was far below this most of the time. So the animals are on this bathtub ring. Here's the highest points of the animals. You see different animals, different colors. So the Two of the colors don't differentiate on this. Here's the peccary and the saber tooth, more saber tooth bones in yellow. Two giant ground sloths scattered as red. So they're up on the, on the bathtub ring. Well, that bathtub ring will be shown here and graphed out. These are the highest points. Again, they're all between 40 and 43 meters below the water surface. And here's the bottom of the cave, bones on the bottom. So these animals died in water and floated to the sides of the pit. And if we consider that 
it had to be when sea level was below that point. Here's the depth. And unfortunately for the Yucatan Peninsula, that's kind of what sea level patterns looks like, looks like in the dates for sea level. So because it's such a broad range, uh, somewhere between 13,500 and maybe 9,000 years ago is when the animals showed up in there, perhaps, or when the water was at that level. So it gives us kind of an idea about the range of possibilities, but it's a 5,000 year time span. So we've tried radiocarbon dating. It's hard in the tropics. Protein does not survive in the tropics, and there's no, this is no exception. Uh, we got less than 2% of the amino acids remaining in this, this rib. Actually, one of the teeth that we did. This had nothing in it. Um, we tried a molar, an incisor, and the 12th rib of the girl, and we got no protein to speak of out of their amino acids. We don't know where they come from, so they couldn't be dated. You can also see some of the characteristics of the tooth that I'll come back to. Bad dental work. Okay. So we weren't able to. What the? Oh, shoot. Oh, that's cute. Oh, my slide just disappeared. Okay. slightly different methods and they came in within 15 years of each other. Wow. So the date we got is 10,976 10, plus or minus 20 years. That's the average of the two days. That makes her the oldest human skeleton in the Americas. The, uh, um, but it's because it's tooth enamel, some people don't trust tooth enamel. They don't, haven't ever worked with it, they don't know what to do with it. The bone, mineral bone is not reliable for dating because it's easily contaminated. Tooth is generally accepted, but some of them were, were willing to say that, well, maybe you know, it's possible that they have exactly the same degree of contamination, and therefore, and they seem to forget that science is a matter of probabilities. But anyway, um, so because of that, it's backed up. Now, one thing that's really nice about this, this site, is that we have, get this without turning something else over. See these formations? Oh, no. Hang on. <laughs> Later. <laughs> um, it's just too distracting to be buzz in my pocket. Okay. Um, See these kind of spiky things? Mm -hmm. These are calcite crystals. And these are the kind of crystals that form when water splashes onto a surface and scatters its mist. They don't form underwater, they form above water. And they form on the bone, this formed on, the, on this mandible, there was another piece that was there that other divers coming in swept it off so they could get a better picture of the mandible. Um, but we have these on a number of bones both the human and the gauntlet there, as a means of getting a minimum age, because they clearly formed after the bones came to rest in the bottom of the cave. And these we, we have dated with uranium thorium dating, a completely different method from radiocarbon, but still working on the basis of uh, radioactive decay. The divers went down with a very well planned procedure with uh, labeled cards, it's numbered each of the florets, three of these florets that they were going to pick up, and labeled jars to put them in. It's 
so they didn't have to take any notes when they were down there. They just had the photographer taking pictures while they were. And so this is one of the florets being taken off and <coughs> swept into one of the collection jars. We had these dated at uh, University of New Mexico, and they showed over multiple dates. There's like over 20 dates on these things. Um, they began forming on the bones by 12,000 years ago, and all of them ceased forming by 9,600 years ago. So that's the span of time during which they were forming before sea level came up and completely permanently overrode them at, at about 9,600 years ago. Now, so based on that, we have we have not yet sandwiched between 12 and 13,000 years, with the probable age being very close to 13,000. It actually calibrates it between 12,700 and 12,900 years. Um, the closest individual to her, if you want to know, is uh, the, the Arlington Springs, now he's a man again, um, which consists of two femur fragments. So she's not only older, she's even more complete. So we also tried, why not, try a DNA extraction effort. We've got nothing to lose. We had done at WSU by Brian Kemp. He uh, roped in two of his uh, colleagues from graduate school, one of whom is at Texas, the other is at, uh, at the University of Illinois. And they were able to extract DNA from this waterlogged bone, which is a real big surprise. And what it showed was mitochondrial haplogroup D1, which is not common among Native Americans, but it's found only in Native Americans and scattered all the way over across the continents, mostly in South America. It's a fairly high proportion of those in the southernmost cone of South America. But because it is only found in the Americas, it is, it is believed by geneticists to have been evolved in Beringia, that connection between Siberia and Alaska that was a little refugium for humans and wildlife for several thousand years at the height of glaciation. So they came down from there, and her folks ended up in Yucatan Peninsula. What this shows is, although she has physical characteristics consistent with Paleo-Americans, evidently Paleo-Americans are descended from the same genetic stock as later Native Americans are. Whether they are in an ancestor-descendant relationship cannot be said from that evidence. It may be true, but it cannot be said, despite what the newspapers say. Okay, now her physical characteristics, one is She's really, really thin. Uh, that, that humorous, this woman's hands are quite small. She's a pretty small lady. Uh, that humorous is one and a half centimeters in diameter. Three quarters of an inch in diameter. That's really small. It's the size of my little finger. She also had rather severe osteoporosis. She's 16, 15 to 16 years old, if you keep that in mind. Osteoporosis. And she's got a lot of cavities. This is showing two of the three big cavities in her front, upper front tooth, upper central incisor. There are also apic, or, uh, cervical cavities around the, the contact between the enamel and the, and the root, in this and many other teeth. There are probably over 50 small cavities in her mouth. I don't think I've tallied up yet. So there's another fellow working on the dental anthropology of it. So she's really short, she's really skinny, and she's got bad teeth. We know those things. Also, there's very little wear on her teeth. Very, very little wear. She's 15 to 16 years old, and even her first in, first molars show hardly any wear on them at all. Yes? Um, on, on these kind of bones, do you pick up Paris lines or other signs on the fish? Um, with that osteoporosis, it's going to be really hard. But we don't have the femur yet, and we don't have the tibia yet. Those are the two that we use to do Harris lines on. Uh, did not see them on the humerus, but there is no cortic, no uh, trabecular bone left in the, the uh, and it broke out when the head broke off. So we don't have it there. But she's really osteoporotic, so the chance of seeing hair signs is going to be pretty slim. Okay, so what did she look like? This is a complicated process because at the time this stuff was rolling, we were trying to do this all without taking her out, just leave her in place leave the other animals in place, study them as they are, using modern technologies. Other divers have gotten in and disturbed them, and it's not impossible to continue to do that, but um, we try. So here's how we tried it. Let me 
smart this time. <laughs> there. <laughs> Okay, so we did a three-dimensional model of the skull and the mandible from photographs. And this is the skull sitting, you'll notice it was brown before, now it's kind of black. Well, in 2011 we put her away, the skull away in a, in a uh, closed box. And it's red to begin with because it's got iron staining. In the closed box, we shut off all the oxygen other than what was in there, and a few bacteria that were present used up all the oxygen that was there and changed it to a reducing environment. And when you do that, iron compounds turn black. She was black as that black background when we first exposed her to the, to the uh, water again, and this is four days later when she started to turn slightly brown again. It freaked the divers out, but I thought it was probably a redox process, and so it turned out to be in. And, uh, they calm down after a while. But they still talk about how bad it was as that happened, but it's no big deal. It's just color. But anyway, we did multiple photographs. or 360, uh, 36 photographs around each side. So you can see the, the white marks for uh, every 10 or 20 degrees on around it. And this is a single screen grab of a 3D model based on those photographs. From that, we printed Skull, I'm sorry it's out of focus, but all my pictures of it were for some reason. We printed it and then put the front teeth that were loose back in in model form and rebuilt her nasal bone and used that to see what she looked like. This is my friend Tom, Tom McClellan. He and I did Kennewick Man this way and some other individuals, and we, we did her. But to give you a better idea how it goes, Basic skull, tissue thickness, markers and eyeballs and nasal cartilage is added. Um, muscles, face. I expected her face, this part of her face to look like it does. I didn't expect the eyes to have the slant that they do, but that's what the bone dictates. Dictates. I think it must be the mic is drawing its power off. So that's how Naya looks. So what do we know about her? Female, 15 to 16 years old, about 4 feet 10, very thin, bad teeth. She's Paleo-American in her morphology, but her genetic heritage says she comes from Laryngia. But the big question is, are she and the extinct animals the same age? So we did also did radiocarbon dating on the enamel and uranium thorium dating on the florets from the goblet there. And what we found was that the answer is, drum roll, no, they're not. She dates around 12,800 years. The goblet there dates around 40,000. So they're pretty far apart. So we really can't say that Naya rode in on a gomphothier. <laughs> and they got, you know, that picture of her with her pet gomphothier is really not true. But it's still possible. Remember the other animals we have? We have saber-toothed tigers. Yeah. Maybe this is the right image that we should be thinking of. This is Frank Rosetta. She's obviously not built like that, but you know, the saber tooth is the main thing here. There we go. Thanks. I should say that we have collected her skull uh, and uh, one scapula, half a clavicle, and most of, of the uh, uh, left humerus uh, because they were broken by other divers that were coming in there and putting their hands down. But uh, uh, the skull and mandible are in pretty really good shape. They're you know, each missing a tooth, but we, we have the teeth, so they're not missing anything really. Um, and uh, uh, they are, ha they have been stabilized, they've been desalinized, stabilized, uh, sampled, or sampled, desalinized, stabilized in that order, and are now safely ensconced in the treasure room at the National Museum of Anthropology in Mexico.
Hmm. So, questions? 